Hello and welcome to the Minimum Competence episode for Friday, December 22nd, 2023. I'm your host for today, Andrew Leahy, a tax and technology attorney from New Jersey. In today's episode, we have Paul Weiss with the largest commercial lease of the year. Clarence Thomas called to recuse himself. Giuliani goes the Alex Jones bankruptcy route and Trump plans to gut the civil service if reelected. Let's reflect and in the final moments of the year, let's weave our dreams into the fabric of the coming days stitching a tapestry of hope and renewal and today's legal news. But first, a quick update. We're going to be moving to a 3 p.m. Eastern time release time in order to build in a bit more time to work on the show in the morning and get our arms around what the news of the day will be. Same show you've gotten used to, slightly later in the day. Enjoy. On this day in legal history, December 22nd, we mark the passage of the Embargo Act in 1807, a significant legislative maneuver influenced by President Thomas Jefferson. This act emerged against the backdrop of the Napoleonic Wars in Europe, a tumultuous period marked by widespread conflict and political upheaval. Jefferson, keen on maintaining American neutrality and avoiding the perils of war, saw the Embargo Act as a strategic tool to prevent American involvement. The act prohibited trade with all foreign nations, a sweeping measure aimed at deterring any actions that could entangle the United States in European conflicts. It represented a bold assertion of American sovereignty, illustrating a preference for isolation over the potential risks of international engagement. The law was designed to leverage American trade as a means of peacekeeping, hoping that economic pressure would encourage European powers to respect American neutrality. However, the Embargo Act's broad scope led to significant challenges in enforcement. Its restrictions created substantial economic hardships, particularly for American merchants and sailors who relied heavily on international trade. The act inadvertently harmed the very citizens it aimed to protect, leading to widespread criticism and opposition. The economic repercussions were immediate and severe, sparking significant distress in the maritime economy, especially in the New England states. The law not only disrupted commerce, but also instigated a rise in smuggling and illicit trade as merchants sought to circumvent the restrictions. This unintended consequence highlighted the difficulties in enforcing such an extensive trade ban. The political fallout from the Embargo Act was also notable. It fueled domestic tensions, exacerbating regional divides, and contributing to a growing discourse on states' rights and federal power. The act became a focal point of political debate, with Jefferson's opponents using it to question the wisdom and efficacy of his administration's policies. Recognizing the impracticality and unpopularity of the Embargo Act, the U.S. government moved to replace it with the Non-Intercourse Act in 1809. This new legislation was a more targeted approach, specifically barring trade only with France and Great Britain, the primary belligerents in the European conflicts. The Non-Intercourse Act sought to address the deficiencies of its predecessor, aiming for a more sustainable balance between diplomatic caution and economic necessity. In retrospect, the Embargo Act of 1807 stands as a testament to the complexities of foreign policy and the challenges of balancing national interests with global entanglement. It reflects an era of American history where isolationism and neutrality were key themes in the nation's approach to international affairs. Despite its shortcomings, the act is an important chapter in the legal and political history of the United States, illustrating the ongoing struggle to navigate the treacherous waters of international relations. Paul Weiss, a.k.a. Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison, has signed the largest commercial lease in the U.S. this year, committing to a 20-year agreement for 765,000 square feet across 18 floors at 1345 Avenue of the Americas in Midtown Manhattan. This move is part of a broader trend in New York City where law firms, alongside the financial sector, have been notably active in expanding their office spaces, as evidenced by a significant increase in the proportion of leases being expansions compared to the previous year. The firm's move, leaving its nearly 30-year-old location at 1285 Avenue of the Americas, reflects the growing dynamism and spatial demands of law firms in the city. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas is facing increasing calls for recusal from cases involving former President Donald Trump's attempts to overturn the 2020 election results, particularly in light of his wife's active participation in challenging the election. These calls have intensified as pivotal January 6th-related cases approach the Supreme Court. The new Supreme Court Code of Ethics, which emphasizes a justice's need to recuse if their impartiality might reasonably be questioned, particularly when a justice's spouse is significantly involved in a case, adds weight to these requests. Justice Thomas, appointed by former President George H.W. Bush, is known for his reluctance to bow to criticism. However, the involvement of his wife, Virginia Thomas, a.k.a. Ginny Thomas, in efforts to overturn the 2020 election, including her presence at the pro-Trump rally before the January 6th Capitol attack, and her correspondence with Trump's former chief of staff, raises serious concerns about his impartiality. Despite these concerns, Thomas has not publicly addressed his wife's involvement and has not responded to requests for comment. Democratic lawmakers, including Senator Richard Blumenthal and several House Democrats, have urged Thomas to recuse himself, citing the potential conflict of interest. The situation is unprecedented, with significant implications for Trump's eligibility for the 2024 presidential race and the broader question of presidential immunity from prosecution. 
While some Democratic senators have expressed concern, Thomas's supporters argue that his recusal is unnecessary. Notably, Thomas recused himself from one January 6th case involving former Trump advisor John Eastman, but has otherwise shown resistance to recusal demands. The situation remains tense, with concerns about the impact on democracy and the integrity of judicial proceedings. Rudy Giuliani, the former mayor of New York, has filed for bankruptcy following a $148 million judgment against him in a defamation case involving two former Georgia election workers. Giuliani, renowned for his leadership after the 9-11 attacks and later as former President Donald Trump's lawyer, claimed assets between $1 million and $10 million against liabilities of $100 million to $500 million. This bankruptcy filing comes amid his criminal charges in Georgia and is seen as a strategy to appeal the penalty and manage other debts. Giuliani's spokesperson argued that the punitive amount was beyond his capacity to pay. The bankruptcy process typically allows for debt reorganization or elimination, but in this case, it might not absolve Giuliani of the defamation penalty due to the nature of his conduct, which judges have deemed willful and malicious. The defamation case arose from Giuliani's false accusations of election fraud against Wandria Shea Moss and her mother, Ruby Freeman, leading to severe threats against them. Despite admitting to defamation in court, Giuliani continued making these claims, resulting in a second lawsuit from Moss and Freeman. A federal judge has ordered immediate payment to the plaintiff, citing risks of Giuliani concealing assets. The bankruptcy filing lists several creditors, including Hunter Biden and Noel Dunphy, the latter suing Giuliani for sexual assault, harassment, and wage theft. Apart from personal liabilities, Giuliani faces lawsuits from Smartmatic and Dominion Voting Systems for claims about vote flipping in the 2020 election. His law license has been suspended in New York, and he faces disbarment in Washington. The bankruptcy filing is a significant turn in Giuliani's career, from being Time Magazine's Person of the Year in 2001 and a Republican presidential candidate, to facing multiple legal and financial challenges. Donald Trump's recent promise to reintroduce Schedule F, an executive order granting him the power to overhaul the federal workforce, has sparked significant opposition from unions, Democrats, and watchdog groups. They fear this move would enable Trump to replace tens of thousands of government civil servants with loyalists and implement his far-right policies should he win the 2024 presidential election. This plan is seen as a step towards politicizing the federal bureaucracy and potentially steering it towards autocracy. In response, opponents are gearing up for legal challenges and strategic preparations. The Biden administration is considering a rule change that would make it harder for Trump to reintroduce Schedule F by allowing federal employees to retain their employment protections even if their job classifications change. This rule, expected by spring of 2024, could delay but not entirely block Trump's efforts. Currently, presidents can appoint thousands of political appointees, but the career civil service, consisting of about 2 million workers, remains unaffected. Schedule F would change this, enabling the firing of up to 50,000 civil servants. Legal fights are anticipated with unions and watchdogs ready to sue Trump if he follows through on his promise. The National Treasury Employees Union previously sued Trump over this issue, and groups like the American Federation of Government Employees are prepared to litigate again. Trump supporters, including some conservative judges, argue for broad presidential powers to fire government workers. Trump has used his campaign rallies to promise an overhaul of the, quote, deep state, a term used by conspiracy theorists to describe a supposed clandestine network within the government. He has vowed to pass reforms, allowing the president to fire any executive branch employee. Other Republican presidential candidates, such as Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy, support similar policies. Critics like U.S. Senator Chris Van Hollen are actively working to protect government workers from such potential actions, emphasizing the need to safeguard the government from being used to advance personal agendas or vendettas. And with that, I thank you so much for listening to Minimum Competence, your daily news podcast for lawyers. If you're looking for more than Minimum Competence, links to further reading on all the topics touched on today are in the show notes. And reviews go a long way towards helping new listeners to find our show. If you have a moment and can leave a rating or review on your podcast player, we'd sure appreciate it. And if you know someone that might be interested in a story we cover, consider sending them the episode. Minimum Competence is available at minimumcomp.com and wherever you get your finely crafted podcasts. If you haven't checked out the website in a while, give it a look. There are complete transcripts and resources for each episode and its corresponding segments, as well as an opportunity to receive new episodes in email newsletter form. We'll see you back here on Tuesday, the 26th. And until then, remember, as December's chill bids the year farewell, we learn that endings are merely whispers of new beginnings. Or, you know, whatever. <laughs>